All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I'm kind of going to do, normally on Wednesday nights is when I do more of an expository type of preaching. Expository means we just go through kind of verse by verse and, and just I preach through the entire chapter. I'm going to be doing that for this sermon this morning through this chapter in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now I've got a few other references we're going to turn to. And just so you're aware, as we get into this, the main focus of this sermon is, is found there in verse number 12 where we just read, the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is a great statement that is made. That is a true statement. And I think a lot of people these days are not understanding what that means. And there's a lot of people who profess to be Christians and claim to be disciples of Christ and claim to be doing all this stuff for Christ that suffer zero persecution. And I believe the Bible when it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We need to expect the persecution if you plan on living a godly Christian life. It will come or else this verse is not true. I believe 100%. And especially in the times that we're living in today. Now, I don't care what time or what place you grew up in or live in. I believe this verse is universal and can apply to all times throughout ages. Now, granted, there are some places that are worse than others. There are some places that experience even heavier persecution and tribulation than other places. That goes without saying. I mean, we know that in many places in the Middle East, you know, you can get killed for trying to convert people to Jesus Christ. You can be put to death for that. That is a much more serious persecution than what we face here. However, if you are going to live godly in Christ Jesus, I believe that we, you, everybody will go through persecution at some point. You have to be or else this verse is not true. Let's get started, though, back in, uh, in verse number one, because this is what is going on today. This is completely relevant to where we're at and what is going on in our world today. Verse number one, this know also that in the last days, perilous times should come. Perilous means dangerous, right? There's a lot of peril. There's a lot of danger coming. And I know, I believe for one, that we are living in the last days. It's evident. We see all the wickedness going around. And even Jesus said, and we're going to get to this here in the next few verses. In Matthew chapter 24, it says, As it was in the days of Noah... So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man, when Jesus Christ comes back. And what happened in the days of Noah? The wickedness of the earth had gotten exceeding great. It became very violent. People were harming one another. It was a very dangerous place. It was very perilous. To the point to where God said, I'm going to wipe everybody out and start over again with Noah and his family. And that's exactly what he did. The, the flood came and destroyed all the creation. And, and it's, he started back over again fresh with Noah. And then it also references the days of Lot. Right? As it was in the days of Lot. And what were the days of Lot? Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Exactly. Lot was living in Sodom. He was, he was the only saved person. The Bible says that Lot was a righteous man. He was just before God. He was justified because he was a believer. He put his faith on the Lord. And God sent his angels to go bring Lot and his family out of Sodom because God was not going to pour out his wrath on the city without taking care of, of his son, his child, a child of God, a believer in the Lord. He, he went to protect him and get him out before his judgment rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Though, that's the way the world is headed these days. The more we are accepting, the more we're tolerating, and the more this homosexual sodomite agenda is being pushed forward, the closer we're getting to this perilous times. And, and look, it, it only makes sense when, these, when you look at the attributes, and we went over this on Wednesday night, but we're going to go over a little bit again today. We see all of these attributes in chapter 3 here, where we just read. These are the same attributes that you find in Romans chapter 1 of the people that are reprobate. Here in verse number... Um, 
8. Look at verse number 8 here in, first Tim in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says, Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now, this doctrine of a person being reprobate, that word reprobate means rejected. It says here, concerning the faith. What is it that saves us? It's our faith, right? For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith, in that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our faith, our faith in Christ is what saves us. It says here that they are reprobate concerning the faith. They are rejected concerning the faith. They cannot believe. Even if they wanted to, they can't believe. That's why it says in verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. No matter how much they learn, and so they could be reading the Bible, says they're never going to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is a doctrine that is not taught anymore very widely these days. It's still taught. It's, there's still people that believe this doctrine, but it's kind of fallen by the wayside recently. And this is a doctrine that is extremely important to understand, and it's, it's extremely important to understand the people that hate God. The people that are reprobate, the people that are rejected by God, Romans chapter 1 calls them haters of God. Let's, let's turn there, if you would, real quick, because I don't think we can go over this enough times. I know some of you already understand this, but keep your finger here. We're coming back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. There's a lot of people get this wrong. And they repeat things that they hear. <coughs> There is a fight going on, and first of all, it's a spiritual battle. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our fight is a spiritual battle. We are, we are in this, you know, we are here to promote the truth. We're here to promote the Word of God. But there are many people out there that are wicked people that hate God and that are actually children of the devil, and that they are fighting against what we are trying to promote. And we need to know who that enemy is because the Bible describes people here that hate God. And it should be evident, but we're told and, and being brainwashed to try to accept these people. Look at verse number 21 of Romans chapter 1. We'll start right there. The Bible reads, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So it says here, like I said in verse 21, that when they knew God, when they knew who God was, when they heard about God, when they heard from the Bible, from God's Word, who the true God is. It says, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain in their own imaginations. And basically what they're doing is they're, they're just making up their own God because they, they worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. And that's what people do these days that reject God. They come up with their own religion, their own philosophies. You get a lot of people that reject God, but what do they turn to? The earth and the environment and the animals. And I mean, some religions even lift up, you know, cows. Have you heard of a sacred cow? It's like from the Hindu religion. They actually believe that cows are a sacred animal, that they've lifted up this, this animal, this beast, this creature that God has made for us to an elevated status of godhood. And the Bible says here that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. This is, this is the path of the reprobate. Because verse number 24 says, Wherefore, which means for this reason, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So for the cause that we just read, because that they knew God, they glorify Him not as God, and basically they don't want to have anything to do with God. They've rejected God. For that reason, it says God gave them up to uncleanness. That is the root cause of why God's given them up. It says to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, and he gets a little bit more specific on what that actually means, dishonoring their bodies between themselves. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this cause, 
God gave them up unto vile affections. That word vile is an older word, but it's a strong word. It means disgusting, vile, sick, twisted, unnatural, vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. The Bible is explaining the reason why people become homosexual. It's not because they were born that way. When you're naturally born into this world, you have natural inclinations. We have a sin nature. We have a nature to sin. We have a nature to steal. We have a nature to tell lies. We have a nature that'll... that'll lead us to doing the wrong thing sometimes, right? Our sinful, fleshly nature. But homosexuality, the Bible says, is against nature. That is not something that even the sinful man is inclined to do until God gives them up, until God gives them over to the reprobate mind. This is what we're seeing here in Romans chapter 1. He gives the reasoning why. He says, look, they heard, they heard about God, they knew God, but they decided not to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't want to have anything to do with God. So God says, fine, you want to reject me? I'll reject you. And he gave them over to vile affections to do these things between themselves. It says in verse uh, 28, and, and here's it again, it's the exact same thing I'm saying. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The same way that didn't, they didn't want to have anything to do with God, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. He gave them over this rejected mind to start doing these things that they normally would never do. Now look, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I didn't get saved until I was 20 years old. I was always revolted by homosexuality. I always revolted by sodomy. If I ever saw like guys hugging or anything like that, like, it turns your stomach. It's, it's sick. It's twisted. Even naturally, as an unsaved person, that is disgusting. Any normal person would know that. Anybody who's not reprobate and given up on God or hasn't just been brainwashed so much by this world into thinking that, no, that's actually okay, would realize that. But in Romans chapter 1, he says... Look, the same way they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind and to do those things. But let's keep reading here. I'll, I'll, I'll reread that verse, number 28. And even as they, these people that rejected God, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29, now we're continuing on talking about the same people. Who are these people? The people that, that are given over to these unnatural affections. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. So the people that do these things, these sodomites or the homosexuals, they're filled with all unrighteousness according to the Bible. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. All of these things are attributes of the person who has been rejected by God. Now, it's important to get that. I mean, that is the simple, plain reading of the text. It's not adding interpretation to it. He's if you continue reading, it's, it's, a, it's all one statement in one sentence. We're not starting a new thought. The same people that were given over to unnatural affections have all of these qualities. Is what it's saying. They're filled with all of this stuff. And then in verse 32 it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And what that's saying is, these people know that all of this stuff is wicked and wrong and, and it's deserving of death according to the Bible. Yep. And not only do they just continue to do them anyways, they actually derive pleasure out of it. Yep. It is. It's perverted. It's sick. Now, uh, again, your, your 
natural sinner will have much more of a tendency to, to be ashamed or sorry for the things that they do that are wrong than these people. It says they actually glory in their shame. And that's why you see the quote-unquote gay pride parades. That's why you see them just exalting and lifting up their perversion and just flaunting it for the whole world to see. They're not ashamed of that stuff. They actually take pleasure in it and pleasure in those that do them. Now, what some people say, what I've heard, a lot of ignorant people that don't know the Bible and don't even understand how to read in context, they'll say, oh, because when, when, when I preach against the sodomites, against the homosexuals, according to the Bible, the Bible says, you know, God's law, they deserve the death penalty. But I said, if mankind lie with man, he lies with a woman, both of them shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them, so they have committed an abomination. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, and also in Leviticus 18, it says the same thing, basically. But um, in God's law, it says that it's restated here in Romans chapter 1 that they're worthy of death. And what people say is that, oh, you're just a hypocrite because you're saying that the homosexuals are worthy of death. But then they, they go to this list of all of these things and they'll say, they'll pick one out and say, well, what about you? Aren't you... Uh, You know, aren't you ever proud or, or uh, oh, they, they, they love this one, disobedient to parents. Or, oh, so any child that's disobedient to their parents now, we should just put them to death. And they try to pick that apart as if this verse is saying that every single sin in there is worthy of death and that we're just cherry picking homosexuality as being the one that we're going to stand against. Completely misunderstanding what this verse is even saying. It's saying, no. The people who are given over to the strange flesh or queer flesh, the queers are the ones that are filled with all of those attributes. It's not saying that every single person that does any one of these things deserves death. It's saying that the sodomite is filled with all of those things. So let's go back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 where we started. I'm just laying the groundwork for the sermon this morning because... The, the people don't get this, and it's sad. And people have, a, have an improper, Im unbalanced view of the Bible and of Christianity and, and of how we as Christians ought to feel about these things and believe regarding these issues. We're being warned here in chapter 3 that perilous times are going to come. It's going to get dangerous. Because in verse 2, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, Looks familiar, doesn't it? Same exact attributes that we saw in Romans chapter 1. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, again, same thing. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. We're listing off the same exact thing. We're talking about the same group of people here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that we saw in Romans chapter 1. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. They hate people that are doing good, which is why there's a protest going on outside of Verity Baptist Church this morning. Hundreds of people are supposed to be there protesting. Even up to a thousand, I've heard. I don't know. I don't know who's there right now, but I've heard there's supposed to be hundreds of people showing, yea, even up to a thousand showing up to protest. Why? Because they're despisers of those that are good. Because they hate the Word of God. They hate God. They're proud. They're and, you know, a lot of these people are also deceived and brainwashed. They're not all just sodomites out there protesting. And that's the sad part, and that's the re one of the reasons for the sermon this morning, is that you got so-called professing, cr cr professing Christians standing with the haters of God. Now, I don't know about you, but the last person that any believer ought to be standing with is a sodomite. When you look at all the attributes of the sodomites, according to Romans chapter 1, that's who they are. We ought not to be yoking up with them. What concord hath Christ with Belial? What agreement is there, you know, light with darkness? With someone that loves God versus someone that hates God? There's no agreement there. Verse 4 says, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than loving, lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. From such, invite them over to your house and, and, and do it. No, turn away from them. Have nothing to do with them. These are not the people you need to be friends with. 
Verse number six, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. These people are subtle and they work in guile. They creep into houses. They don't knock on a door, walk in the front door. It says they creep into houses and they lead away people. That's the way they operate. According to God's word, at least. I mean, if I, hey, I, I believe God's word. I believe this to be true. Amen. I'm not going to listen to what the world has to say. Any, I don't care what TV show is on or what movie that, that wants to say, oh, there, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just a different lifestyle. Yeah, that's an understatement. A different lifestyle? A different lifestyle that's full of all of this, all of these attributes, all this wickedness. That's what their lifestyle is full of. It's not just a preference. They're haters of God, my friends. Verse number 9, because we already read verses 7 and 8, talking about them being reprobate concerning the faith. Verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. The Apostle Paul was suffering persecutions and afflictions. He goes into it in depth about all the persecutions he's faced, about being shipwrecked, about being beaten, you know, about falling in among robbers, about people just attacking him and persecuting him for his faith. Apostle Paul has been through a lot. He says, you know the persecutions and afflictions that I have endure, endured which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Amen. We need, you know, the Apostle Paul stood firm on God's word. When the persecution came, he didn't shy away. He didn't shut his mouth. He didn't back off. He didn't quit the fight. When the hard times came, he stood up strong. He stood up tall. He stood on the rock, on the foundation of God's word. And he says, out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. God is able to deliver thee. That's why we sang that song this morning. He is able to deliver thee. Because we are able, we, but we need to make sure that we're staying, standing strong and, and not backing down. Because we are in a spiritual warfare. We don't need to retreat. We need to go on the offense. See, what they do is they get real loud. And they'll get all the liberal news media. And they'll get people pitted against the Christians that say, No, the Bible, thus saith the Lord. You know, God says homosexuality is still a sin. God says it's still disgusting. And not just a sin. I went over this on Wednesday. I'm not going to get too in depth. It's not just like any sin. These people are reprobate. They are rejected by God already. They're given over to a reprobate mind to do these things. And they're filled with all this stuff. That's why they are uh, predators and pedophiles and they attack people and they go to convert them through any means that they can. They defile people trying to get them into their uh, perverted way of life. They go after the innocent. That's why so many of them have been molested as children and now all of a sudden they become sodomites because They've already been abused and they've been attacked in the cycle. They try to perpetuate that cycle because they don't reproduce. They don't have other children. They need to go out and recruit people and they, they pick on the, uh, the helpless, on, on the, the, the young and the innocent because they're evil and wicked in their heart. But Paul endured all these persecutions. He says, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, look, you know the persecutions I went through. And look, if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution too. Why? Because God's word has never been popular with the world. Never. And I'm sick of hearing these people, oh, what would Je Jesus would go to that gay bar. Jesus would go to these. But no, look, he wouldn't be hanging out with the sodomites. Jesus did go to sinners, yes, to save, the, to save people. He came in his world to seek and to save that which is lost. Yes, he did. But people that have already been rejected, that have already hate God and, have, and have put God, did not want to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to reprobate mind? Why would he go after people he's already rejected? Doesn't make any sense. 
People say, well, what would Jesus be doing? Well, what did Jesus already do? In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, do you remember when, when Abraham met the three men that were on their way to Sodom? I believe that one of those men was an was a Old Testament incarnation of Jesus Christ. We see a few occurrences of that, of the Son of God showing himself and speaking with Abraham. And I'm not going to go into all the, the research. Look it up later. Um, but when Abraham was talking to him, and he was talking to God, because he asked God, he was saying, well, you know, what if you find 50 righteous people? Are you going to destroy it then? And God said, nope, not for 50 people. And he goes on down. He, he keeps on whittling it down. Like, well, what about 40? Well, what about 30? What about, you know, and he gets all the way down to 10 people saying, God, will you still destroy Sodom if there's 10 people that are, you know, righteous people, 10 people that are saved in there? And God says, no, I won't do it for 10's sake. Now, and there wasn't 10 people that were saved in, in the land of Sodom. And when I say, what would Jesus do? And what did he already do? Well, what was the judgment on Sodom? We know. It's fire and brimstone. That was his judgment. He didn't send his angels in there to preach the gospel to everybody. He sent his angels in there to get the one righteous guy out. And then rain the fire and brimstone down. And that was his judgment. And we believe Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. We believe that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Amen? There's one God. There's one Lord. One faith. One baptism. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Well, if God's the one raining down judgment, don't you think Jesus is in agreement with God? Being one God? But let's keep reading here. Verse number 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to get only worse. The evil men are going to continue deceiving, tricking other people, and themselves even being deceived, believing the lies that they're spewing out. And it's going to be a continual cycle, getting worse and worse. Verse 14, But, but you, O man of God, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. No matter how much they're changing, no matter how much more wicked they're getting, no matter how many lies they're telling, no matter how many people they're deceiving, no matter what this world thinks, you keep and the things which you have learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. Old Testament and New Testament. It's all given by God. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We use the whole Bible here. It's not just the New Testament. It's not just the red letters that Jesus spake. It's the whole Bible. Jesus Christ is the Word. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. We have the Word right here. Jesus Christ was the embodiment of all of these words. He was the Word of God made flesh. He wasn't just the red letter parts. He's the whole thing. The Bible says these words are true and faithful. And what did Jesus Christ say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The words are truth. Jesus is truth. Jesus is the word. Jesus was the word made flesh. You need God's word to be saved. You need Jesus Christ to be saved. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how you get your faith. It's by the Bible. It's by God's word. Your faith needs to be on the Word. It needs to be on Jesus Christ to be saved. It all makes sense. It's perfect. Turn, if you would, to um, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter six. Luke chapter six. Paul says in First John three thirteen, "Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you." The main point I want to drive home this morning is being ready and understanding that if you're going to live godly for Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. If you haven't suffered any persecution, you better just ask yourself, am I living godly? Am I doing what God has for me to do? Am I actually promoting the truth? Does anybody know what I believe? If nobody knows what you believe, you can believe whatever you want. If nobody knows about it at all, where's the persecution going to come from? 
Persecution is going to come from the people that hate God's word, from the people that are resisting the truth, the people who are against God's word. And the scripture teaches us, hey, we're all in this together. We all need to be fighting for the truth. We all need to be going out and preaching the gospel to every creature. We all need to be proclaiming the word of God. The Bible says, you know, Jesus said, what you hear in the secret or in your closet, he says, preach that on the housetops. You know, get the message out. Get the gospel out. Get the good news out. Get God's word out there. People need this. That is our job. And if you are not say, saying anything to anyone, well, it's going to be no doubt that you're not suffering persecution. Now, it doesn't mean you're not saved. You could get saved by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and never say a word to anybody. It doesn't make you unsaved. That faith is there. You're, you're born again. You're a child of God. But just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that you're living godly in Christ Jesus. Because if you were living God, if you were doing the things that God actually planned for you to do, the work that you're supposed to be doing as a servant of God, then you will suffer the persecution. You shall suffer persecution. And in 1 John 3.13, he said, Marvel not, my brother, if the world hate you. Why not? Why, why, is it, why should we not be surprised? If the world comes out and hates us, and hate's a strong word. Hate, when people hate you, let me tell you, it's not a good feeling. It usually gives you a little pit in your stomach. It's not pleasant. Nobody wants to have people just hating on them. But it's something that we have to deal with. And <laughs> what boggles my mind is the people that, that want to be friends with everybody, with the whole world, you know, with, with everyone so that nobody hates them. And that way of thinking means that you think you're better than Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ have that attitude of just, I don't want anyone ever to hate me? No. He says he came to bring a sword. He came to bring division. He says there's going to be people pitted households against each other. Mother-in-laws against daughter-in-laws and daughter-in-laws against mother-in-laws. He came as the truth. He says, look, I'm the way. This is the way that you do it. A lot of people aren't going to like it. A lot of people didn't, which is why he was put to death. Because the haters of God hated Jesus Christ. They didn't just, he didn't just make everybody love him. He was divisive. People, some, some people loved him and they followed him and other people hated him and they, they crucified him. Unless you think you're better than Jesus Christ, wouldn't you expect to see maybe some of that hatred against you if you're actually a follower of Jesus Christ? You ought to be able to see some of both. You ought to be able to see some of the people that, hey man, I love you, I'm with you because I love Jesus too. And then those that hate you and will say nasty things about you because you follow Jesus Christ. John 16, 33 reads, These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Again, then that was Jesus Christ. He said, look, in the world you shall have tribulation. It's going to come. You are going to be persecuted. You will have tribulation. But when it happens, it says, be of good cheer. Have a good attitude about it. Be happy about it when you suffer tribulation. Why? Because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. The world thought they could de defeat and destroy Jesus Christ by nailing him to a cross. All they did was just bring in the salvation of the world, right? By nailing him to the cross, they nailed our sins that was on Jesus Christ to that cross. And when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he had that victory over death and over sin and over hell, and whereby we can be saved. And we could have good cheer. Hey, you have tribulation in the world? That's fine. Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Luke chapter 6, where I had you turn. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 6. Verse number 22. Again, some more words of Jesus here. About having the, the proper attitude when the persecutions come because it's not fun. Anyone who's been through it knows this. But look at verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. Well, that doesn't sound right. What do you mean when men hate you? Why, why would I be blessed? Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. What does that mean? They don't want to have anything to do with you. Hey, we're all going out here. You're not invited. We're separating you from our, co from our company. And shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Now, some people might do this to you for other reasons. But he says, you're blessed if they do it because you're a Christian. 
because you believe in Jesus. Because, oh man, I don't want this guy around me because all he's going to do is talk about Jesus. I don't want this guy around me. Oh, do you know what he believes? He actually believes when the Bible says that homosexuals will be put to death. He actually believes that. We don't have anything to do with that hater. Because that's the big, the, the buzzwords these days are hate, hate speech, you're hating, right? Hate wrong, hate's bad, don't hate, you can't hate anything. Well, look, you can't love if you don't hate. You have to have both. There, there are two sides of the same coin. If you really love something like, for example, I really love my children, and I would really hate for anyone to do anything against my children. How much you love one thing is going to show how much you hate something else. And even these people say, oh, you shouldn't hate anything. No one should ever hate. Where was the world saying that when everybody was cheering the death of Osama bin Laden? Or what about the death of Adolf Hitler? What about the death of any of these people that the world would say, oh, yeah, they were wicked? Celebration, right? We saw this, you know, in Saddam Hussein when they when they celebrated over his death and they pulled down the statue and they broke out, you know, and they did all those things and in celebration over the death of a man. Yet that's acceptable. Isn't that hateful? Wouldn't you say they hate those people then that were that were put to death? Absolutely they were. Of course. But now all of a sudden. As a Christian, if you say, well, I think that these wicked perverts, these predators, these pedophiles ought to be put to death. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you, you have a bad hate. I will celebrate when the pedophile is put to death. Why? Because they're not going to harm anyone else. The same reason why they would say, oh, we celebrate when Osama bin was put to death because he was out, you know, plotting to hurt innocent people. Well, that's what the sodomites do. They plot to hurt innocent children. And when they die, I rejoice. That sounds like a shocking statement, and that's the exact statement that Pastor Jimenez at Verity Baptist Church made that now he's got all these protesters against. Because he said the world's going to be a safe, Orlando's going to be a safer place from the perverts and the pedophiles that were killed in that, in that sodomite bar. Amen. And I say amen. Because the world will be a safer place because I love children more than I love the haters of God. In Luke 6 there, where we were just reading, he says, hey, you're blessed when people cast out your company, when they separate from you, when they cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Say, hey, jump up and down. Like, yeah! Don't be upset. Don't be sad that these people don't want anything to do with you because you're a Christian. He says, leap for joy. He says, behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. He said, you're in good company. If you're getting your name cast out as evil, if you're getting people not want to have anything to do with you because of the stand that you make, because you believe in the Word of God, because you believe in Jesus Christ, amen, that's good. He said, don't let that, don't let that scare you. Don't let that back you down. And, and I'll be honest with you. I was talking to someone yesterday about this, a, a, a new, someone who's newer to the faith or newer to um, you know, living a godly life. And I, and I brought up, you know, I asked them, so how are things going with your family? Are you disowned yet? Because what people will do when, when you actually get on fire and you actually start living, not only believing the Word of God, but living it and, and saying, yeah, you know what, this is true. Even though there's a lot of things in here that the world is offended by, that's offensive to the world, that they hate and they don't want to hear. And they, Oh, I can't believe you believe that. Oh, you believe in some Stone Age Word, you know, book written by man and, and his ignorance. You know, no, it's the word of God. And I'll stand on every word of it to be true. And I don't care if it flies in the face of this world because I know that it does. And some people can't handle that and they'll want to have nothing to do with you. There's going to be family members that you might never speak to again because of the stand that you take on the Bible. And that's not fun. Nobody likes that. I love my family members. I don't want them to just separate from me. But you know what? That's, you can't let that then 
get you out of the fight or change your stance on God's word. God's word's the truth. And we got to stand on the truth. And he's saying, when people separate you, just be glad about it. You're going to have great rewards in heaven over that. You're in good company because that's what they did to the, to, the, to the prophets. We need to be able to suffer that persecution and keep going forward. 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. This was the Apostle Paul speaking. In reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Why? Because God loves to use the weak individuals to glorify His name. When you're, you say, I can't really do much, I'm, I'm weak, I don't have any, any, any uh, good skills, hey, God's really looking to use you. God doesn't take the, the, the most talented people to do a, a work for Him as much as He likes to take the people who don't have that talent. Because Why? Because if you have a real talent, for, take, take myself for example, God gets all the glory and credit for anything that I'm able to do. And I'm not saying that I'm some great preacher. I'm not saying that, that I have these great ways with words. But I have always feared, dreaded, I got sick to my stomach even thinking about getting up in front of anybody to say anything publicly. I'm a computer programmer. Not, not, I was never that type of person that was this extrovert or you know, someone who's really good with words. I've got friends. Hey, they're great. They're great natural leaders, good with words. They have no problems being the center of attention, getting up and talking to people. But God's able to use people that don't have those skills. Why? Because he gets even more honor and glory and credit for doing that because it's only through his power that I'm even able to stand up and do this today. Whatever it is that I'm able to do, it's through the power of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul's saying here, look, when, when I'm sick, when I have reproaches, people are, are railing on me, when people are telling me I'm wrong, when I'm in necessity, when I have need, when I'm in persecutions, when I'm in distress for Christ's sake, he says, I take pleasure in that. He says, I actually think it's a good thing because when I'm weak, then am I strong. Last place we're going to turn, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We need to be able to endure when the afflictions come. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to see a very, very popular um, uh, parable, the parable of the sower. We're in the last days. Things are only going to be getting worse and worse. The people are going to be getting worse and worse. The love of many is going to wax cold. We need, and if, you're going to, if you plan on living godly, expect the persecution. It's going to come your way. It, it has to, because the word of God is true. If you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. But you need to be ready. Matthew chapter 13 We'll start reading in verse 18. Now, hopefully you've all read this before where Jesus gives, prior to verse 18, he gives a story of the parable. He says, a sower goes forth to sow. And you know, some seed falls on uh, stony ground. Some, some seed falls out by the way. Some seed falls on good ground. You know, and he gives all these different examples of what happens. But in verse 18, he explains the parable. He's saying, well, this is actually what the parable means. Verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So we're saying the first example in this parable, the sower is someone going out and preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God. It's explained here that the, the seed is God's word. And they're sowing the seed, and someone hears that seed. They hear the word of God, but they don't understand it. They don't get it. They're saying, okay, well, when that happens, Satan comes along, and he takes the seed out of their heart because he doesn't want them to get saved. So they didn't, they didn't fully receive God's word. They didn't get saved. They didn't, they didn't put their faith on it because they didn't even understand it. That's the first example. Verse 20. But he that received the seed in the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. So anybody that receives the word of God, the Bible says that they're saved. 
Yea, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. They've received the word of God. But if you receive it in the stony places, here it says, they received the word, they got saved, they, with joy they received it. Verse 21, Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. This is talking about the person that has no root. They're not grounded. They're not founded and fully settled in their faith. So that when the persecution arises because of the word, because of what they believe, because of what they've received, it says they're offended. And then they, they, don't, they don't end up being fruitful. They get offended and they stop doing what they're supposed to be doing because they can't handle the persecution. If you want to be able to endure the persecution, you need to be rooted. You need to be grounded. You need to be settled in the Word of God. And the, the, the way, one thing that's going to help you to do that is by, one, coming to church, faithfully come to church, hear the Word preached, two, reading this book on your own, getting to know everything that it says, know what it says, know what you believe, and know why you believe it. If someone comes to you and tries to persecute you, you ought to be able to respond with the Bible. Because this is why you believe it. Not because Pastor Burson said it, not because anybody else said it, but because it says this in the Bible. And if you have this rock to stand on, you could be rooted down and planted when you know the Word of God, then you're not going to be moved. When the persecution comes, you ought to be able to withstand in that day because you have a root where you're rooted down. But it takes energy. It takes effort. It takes study. It takes you to actually do something. You're never going to learn and know the Bible if you never pick it up and read it, if you never come to church, if you never do these things. We need to be able to endure persecution and we also need to be able to exhort and to comfort those that are going through persecution. We ought to be there to be able to relieve them and say, I'm not scared of what the persecution is going to come because this is the way the enemy operates and this is the way that they've operated as far as I've been a pastor and as far as I've ever witnessed and known because the Bible teaches that the homos are implacable and unmerciful, it means they stop at nothing. Now, many of you may not realize what's in their heart and the truth of what the Bible is even saying. And if you have any doubts about this, see me after the service. When the news came out about Pastor Jimenez, believe it or not, we've actually received numerous fo uh, phone calls, emails, people trying to shut us down because of what he said, because they saw that we're associated with them because of this Red Hot Preaching Conference that we're going to. So what they try to do is go full on attack and say, oh man, you know, and they, they try to bring the heat on you to distance yourself from the main target of their attack. Why? Because they don't want him to have any support. But we do support him. And we are going to be there for him because he's going through tribulation and persecution right now and we're going to be there to strengthen him and let him know that you're not standing alone. Because the less people are with you, the more you feel alone, the more, you, the more down you are and, and the less bold you could feel because you feel like, hey, no one's here. That's what happened with Elijah, remember? He's like, he prayed to God. He's like, God, basically, just like, kill me now. I mean, I'm the only one left, God. I'm the only one that's standing up for you and, and, and preaching the word of God. Where is everyone else? But what, what did God say? He says, there are yet 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. He says, I've still, I have preserved unto me 7,000 men. There's still, there's a lot of other people out there, but you don't know it. Now imagine how Elijah would have been. He wouldn't have been asking for God just to take his life, saying, well, I'm the last one. God, just take me because no one wants to hear it. No one wants to listen to what I have to say. If some of those 7,000 would have been like, Amen, Elijah, we're there with you. We're standing with you to edify and to comfort him. And you could say, wow, I'm actually not alone. And to have more courage to go out and do more. Instead, he's just, he's just going to God and kind of throwing his hands up in the air saying, God, I don't know what else to do. No one's with me. That's why it's important that we show our support for the men of God that take the heat and that are, that are willing to stand on the word of God and unashamedly
preach his word. And that's where we're at. Be ready for the persecution. If you haven't had it to date, or even if you have, be ready because if you're going to be living godly, you shall suffer persecution. It's going to come and we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words of comfort and your words of truth, dear Lord. I pray that you would please strengthen us. Lord, help us to fight the good fight, fight the um, spiritual battle that you have before us, dear Lord. Help us not to be silenced by the, by the vocal haters of God that want nothing more to do than to see us shut down. God, I pray that you would please just help us to um, not be ashamed of your word either. Lord, what a shame it is for a Christian to be ashamed of the word of God and to back down when someone confronts them with something that's not popular in today's world that the Bible teaches, that your word teaches us, dear Lord. I'm not ashamed of your word, and I'm going to boldly proclaim it. Lord, I pray that you please help us all to have the same boldness to, to not back down one bit from your word, regardless of how it's dealt with in society, dear God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.